everyone. Thank you for joining me for another Alex on Tech and IT Wire interview. Today we have Thomas Biancoli. He's the Chief Technology Officer at Zebra Technologies and Ryan Go, the Vice President and General Manager of Sales at Zebra Technologies Asia Pacific. Welcome both to the program. Thanks for having us. Yeah, hi, Alex. Hi, hi, yeah. So, uh, look, you're... you're um, Celebrating your fiftieth year, and you're at you're at an event in uh, a ch ch channel partner event in China. Tell us about the uh, what what's been happening today. Well, I think uh, we turned fifty, and uh, as you know, not not many technology companies you know um, has been around for fifty years. So it's no small feat for Zebra to be uh, around for the last uh, fifty years. And I think the reason why um, you know Zebra has been. Uh, um, around for the last 50 years is because of our innovation, right? Innovation is in our culture, it is very deep in the culture. Um, and we celebrated uh, our 50th anniversary um, with a record sales uh, last year, 2018, that we recorded uh, 4.2 billion mm -hmm. US dollar in revenue. And uh, today, you know, we serve uh, over 95% uh, of Fortune 500 companies. We have uh, 10,000 channel partners, which is one of the uh, key reason why we're successful because we have a um, team of uh, China partner that's uh, focused on the selling of products and they've been an excellent, uh, you know, um, reason why, they've been a key reason why we've been successful. Um, and these partners are present over 100 countries. Um, because of innovation, uh, we hold over 4,400 uh, patents, uh, both issued and pending. And uh, we are also present globally um, in 45 countries. And, and we made our first foray into um, the Asia Pacific market in 1996 uh, in Singapore. Um, and over the uh, last um, several years, uh, we continue to achieve a consistent growth in, in APEC. And in Q1 this year, right, Q1 2019, the APEC uh, delivers a 12% year on year, which is an excellent uh, um, growth um, for the company. Yes, well, I mean, 1969 is when uh, man landed on the moon. And uh, so what was what was Zebra's products way back in 1969? What did you start with? So, we, we, so 1969 was a year that uh, um, the two gentlemen, uh, Ed Kaplan and uh, Gary Kress, uh, they first uh, formed uh, what we call data special, specialties. Um, it's not known as Zebra then, um, but in 1973, that's where they make... Um, the first um, what we call hole puncher uh, machine that records post transaction, uh, right. and uh, there, yeah, and thereafter in uh, 1982 um, we make our first entrance with the first um, barcode label printers um, in the world, right? And mm -hmm. uh, by 1986, you know, we had changed our name to Zebra Technology. So uh... yeah, it's kind of, kind of unique. Kind of unique that the the um, enterprise acquisition that occurred in 2014 of Motorola's business ah. um, that 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 part of Motorola was the inventor of the first handheld barcode reader. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, kind of a kind of a fun fact that uh, Zebra uh, DSI originally, as Ryan mentioned, invented the thermal on-demand printing technology, mm -hmm. and uh, the acquisition they did. Um, you know, 45 years later, basically, <laughs> was the, uh, the company that, it, that invented the first uh, handheld device that could read a barcode. And uh, it's been uh, a marriage made in heaven ever since. Yeah, absolutely. So what is uh, Zebra or Zebra best known for today in 2019? And what were some of the new products that you showcased at uh, in China? Maybe I'll start off with. Um, I, I, think, I think today we're, we're best known for... Um, uh, a company that provides uh, um, enterprise uh, solutions to our customers. Mm -hmm. um, I think we're known for um, helping to address uh, you know uh, business issues that uh, companies face. Um, again, um, you know, 1969 or even 1973, you know, we were more focused on building uh, a product, right, um, that serve um, customers. You know, we now provide solutions from RFID to Android uh, mobile devices um, mm. and also mobile print devices that uh, serve. Um, a whole range uh, array of verticals from uh, retail, um, e-commerce to uh, transport logistics and healthcare. Yeah, yeah. and um, yeah, I, I would say, uh, as, as Ryan was saying, what we're most known for today is these areas of RFID, barcode reading, uh, mobile computing, uh, and, and print, right? But where we're really going is looking at how do we make those same technologies more and more autonomous or more and more automated. 
And the way we think about the value we provide at Zebra, it's about providing productivity at the point of activity. So, you know, making that courier that's delivering that package more effective or productive or making the nurse that's administering medication, um, you know, enabling them to do that more efficiently and, and in an error-free fashion. And so we're investing increasingly in technologies that automate the data capture um, and automate the workflow so that those frontline workers can focus on getting the job done and the technology is supporting them in the background. Uh, and so there's a, a number of solutions we can talk about um, where we're, we're, we're delivering IoT-based solutions, so combining sensing with analytics. We're doing that in retail today where we're putting sensors in the infrastructure of a store mm -hmm. that can monitor inventory in real time so somebody doesn't need to go and traverse that store. They can, in order to obtain the inventory information, they can spend that time with customers instead. And so they can focus on selling and serving the customer as opposed to verifying you know, the right inventory is on the shelf and our technology can take over and do that for them. So increasingly, we're seeing our customers come to us for that kind of technology, whether it's RFID or it's other kinds of smart sensing uh, using computer vision and, um, uh, and analytics. Uh, but uh, that's on the back of our core business, which we sell in and out every day around RFID, mobile computing and uh, on-demand printing. Yeah, I mean, and, I... And also in this uh, event, Sorry, we're go showcasing on. a... Uh, solution called uh, Smart Pack. Yeah. So, you know, our partners and I have a chance to look at how Smart Pack works and just basically put together um, camera and uh, sensing technology and so we could look at real time how, um, you know, the the, um, the loaders right, are loading the, the packages into a container. Um, so we know that one of the, the problems that the customer is telling us that they cannot uh, get a full uh, container load. Um, and with this solution, right, we can help optimize the way that the, uh, the, the, um, the, the workers are loading the package into the container real time so actions can be corrected real time um, again, you know, after the, the truck leaves the door, right? So you have no chance to correct uh, that, that load uh, capacity but uh, with, um, with a smart um, tag, you have real time visibility and you can go correct that action and uh, therefore optimizing the entire loading process. So that's one of the solutions um, utilizing, uh, again, IoT, right? Uh, yes. Uh, showcasing here. Yep. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like an enterprise version of Tetris. <laughs> in many ways, in many ways, it is, and, and some of our customers have made that same observation. Yeah. Um, which and, and you know, the, which which brings up another point. Uh, by viewing it that way, um, it's more profound that statement than than you know maybe uh, you realize or maybe you do. But the idea of gamifying the work experience yeah. is something that our customers are looking at. So gamification, um, uh, being able to quantify how well that trailer is being loaded, allows it to be optimized in real time, as Ryan was saying. But it also allows you to kind of keep score, if you will, as to how effective that loader is being and then create a, uh, a competitive, you know, environment or even just pay for performance, which allows, you know, workers that are willing to go the extra mile to receive the benefit for doing so. So, um, yeah, lots of benefits for the, the worker uh, and being able to quantify the workflow and for obviously the, um, the enterprise in, in being able to capitalize on the increased efficiency. Yeah, well, I mean, that's certainly the yeah. first time that I've heard gamification used in an enterprise sense. And uh, I guess, why the heck not? I mean, it makes sense. Yes. Yeah. yeah I actually, uh, uh, just another quick example there, which also plays into automation and, and enterprise asset intelligence. We announced, uh, I guess, about a month ago that we made an investment in a company called Locus Robotics. Mm -hmm. And uh, so locusts make uh, robots that are used in warehouses. They roam around the warehouse with bins on them, and they autonomously navigate the warehouse. And then the workers do the picking, load the, those picked goods for e-commerce fulfillment onto bins on that robot, and then it shuttles those goods over, or those, those uh, orders, over to the shipping area for them to uh, you know, go, go on their journey to your, your front door. And um, one of the things that Locus has done is, is exactly that, where uh, the, each worker wears a Bluetooth badge, mm -hmm. and when they walk up to the robot, a couple of things happen. When they walk up to the robot, the robot presents the pick instructions in that person's native language. Wow. So the facility that I was at a couple of months ago, there were six different languages spoken in this one facility, and the robot would automatically know who that worker is, display the information properly in their native tongue, and then it would also be keeping track of how many picks per hour that person was doing, and this particular uh, customer had implemented a pay for performance on, on those picks, and, and so they use that same term of gamification. It's, it's pretty interesting to see that uh, get uh, taking root in, in the enterprise space. 
Yeah, no, I, um, and I don't know how many people in Australia have noticed, but I notice every time I go to the post office, there's a little Zebra Android device that's used to, to read the barcodes, and I guess that's probably been in place for some time. But, uh, I mean, you know, can you, can you talk about any uh, of the other industries globally and in Australia and New Zealand that are, um, you know, l looking at your efficient delivery and stock management systems? Any other case studies or any other customers you want to mention, if, you, if you're able to mention them? I, I think some of the major retailers in Australia are really using, you know, Zebra devices, um, you know, to interact with customers uh, at, at the storefront. Um, and uh, the uh, the other thing that we're seeing is um, you know, the some of the uh, um, largest uh, um, 3PR companies, the parcel delivery companies, um, have just recently moved over to uh, uh, Zebra PC56 uh, devices, um, so they could uh, become more efficient in delivering uh, the products you know, to the customers. And e-commerce, right? The, um, the the race for speed, right? Um, the race to uh, deliver faster and uh, efficient customers uh, increasing. So putting a device uh, at the front edge of the worker is, is what we have enabled uh, um, the um, the Australia's uh, um, enterprises. And I, I think the other thing is beyond which which I was seeing now a um, the the shift from uh, Windows to Android, right? In warehouses, and that's where we can we now see. Um, that uh, more and more uh, businesses in Australia are now looking to deploy Android devices in mm -hmm. the warehouse. And we've, uh, in this event over here, we showcase two products, which is uh, um, MC33 and MC93. Both are um, Android and mobile computers. They are built, um, they are purpose uh, um, built for um, warehouses. Um, their use cases, for example, right, MC33 um, has different form factors. It has a scan angle that is angled. It has a rotating head a scan angle. It has a grant uh, form factor, and it has an RFID, right? So depending on the use case, um, it is um, it's able to help our customers uh, better optimize um, um, the their uh, picking uh, operation. For example, the MC93 um, is a freezer uh, uh Android devices, so you could use it in, in a cold chain, um, as an example. Uh, so all these are the devices, you know, that we um, and solutions that we believe you know, will be um, what customers in Australia are looking for, and uh, we're really starting to see customers getting uh, very interested uh, in work with us uh, to deploy this um, supply chain solution. And uh, I understand that your technologies uh, are very helpful for your customers who require seasonal and changing workforces in, in the retail space, and I guess this is all part of the whole disruptive trends within Industry 4.0. Yeah, I mean, one of the one of the things that plays into your your previous question as well is we're seeing total cost of ownership as being a, a big driver, and particularly in A and Z. It's not unique to A and Z necessarily, but mm. uh, that it certainly is a driver there. And and if you think about that total cost of ownership, it's not about going with the device um, that's going to give them the lowest cost. It's going to give them the highest total cost of ownership over the life cycle of that device, and then by optimizing that. Many customers we're seeing in, in transportation logistics and retail specifically are looking to leverage that savings to be able to afford to give more workers those devices. So mm -hmm. we're seeing kind of two, two pronged um, approach here. One is optimize the total cost of ownership, but use the optimized savings from that not to save necessarily money on the bottom line, but to spend that on equipping more people with those devices. And so some of the largest, uh, you know, transportation providers in, in Australia and New Zealand are literally equipping, you know, pretty much every one of their workers outside the four walls um, uh, with, with uh, Android type devices and using that um, to get after uh, many multiples of applications. So using it for, uh, using it for receiving, for uh, a proof of delivery, using it for voice communication and collaboration using the device to function as a backhaul since it's connected to, say, the Telstra network mm. to be able to provide telemetry information about the vehicle or the worker, you know, back to dispatch. So the device in many ways is kind of becoming a hub, right, Ryan? It's becoming a hub for connectivity and not just a, um, you know, not, not just a handheld application, but becoming a hub that can connect many different disparate pieces together. Um, and, and so we've made a lot of investments over the last six years to optimize that total cost of ownership. So we work really closely with Google and Qualcomm, and um, we offer, we're well, the only company really uh, in the world that offers a five-year life cycle for Android devices, meaning 
will guarantee software support, patches, fixes, security updates uh, for five years uh, post-release of the device. And um, all of the consumer devices that are out there uh, pretty much shut down support after two years. Uh, and that's just not a, um, an acceptable proposition for you know, enterprise mission critical use cases. Sure, I mean, not even Google offers um, two years for their Pixel, although I think they just extended the, the original Pixel to get Android version 9. So, you know, Google, I guess, is forced but to, by the marketplace to support their older devices. But in enterprise, yeah, that's a big thing. And uh, I'm, I'm also thinking you must have, you must have um, a robust uh, software backend that can crunch all this data, help people to data mine themselves, do all the analytics, um, and, uh, you know, really take advantage of all this information that they now have with such granularity that was never really a, a, available before to this extent. Yeah, you know, that's a great, uh, great observation. And the way that that's evolved is that in, in I would call sort of very data intensive, edge data intensive solutions, we had started to build uh, platforms for each of these solutions. So Smart Pack Ryan mentioned earlier, and then you look at our location solutions capability that allows us to track items in a, on a manufacturing plant floor or in a warehouse or um, you know in a sporting uh, arena as well, like we do with the NFL in North America where we track uh, professional NFL players on the field at every game to within 10, ce- 10 centimeters of accuracy 10 times a second. Mm. So um, you know, using... All of that and that information, collecting all that information on a solution by solution basis, is the path we were, were kind of headed down as those solutions started to get traction. And now, um, actually, in 2017, we launched uh, our Savannah platform. It was the uh, first launch of that platform. Mm-hmm. Last year, we started an early adopter program, started connecting more and more of our portfolio to that platform. And now, Savannah is becoming the data platform upon which we're landing all of the data that we collect from the edge. And what you're going to see from us um, next month is some more announcements around data services Mm -hmm. that allow our partners to be able to access APIs um, and get get access to that data to be able to deliver their own applications. So we see a new wave of partner and independent software vendor opportunity around not writing applications necessarily to devices, but writing applications to the data mm. that helps inform workers as to what they should do or enterprises as to how they should optimize their operations. Um, we think um, in a lot of ways, data is going to become the new device over the next three or four years. Mm. So what are examples of, uh, in a way, um, Savannah has been the use actually uh, in, in a service with Gary Bova, we call it uh, the Zebra Visibility IQ predictive uh, service. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that actually you know, allows a, uh, a customer regular visibility you know, into the uh, um, um, the assets you know, that they use, so that they will know things like what's my asset utilization, because um, how many times do you know whether these devices have been used and uh, how often are they being used? Can you optimize the the fleet of devices uh, that you put in the hands of your workers? You know, um, are they being optimally optimally utilized, or are there opportunities for us to uh, you know improve and reduce the number of devices in the hands of the workers? So um, that device utilization uh, is one of the example of using a Savannah as a platform, and things like you know battery management, right? Um, Firmware update, security update, mm. uh, so that gives um, visibility to the uh, the customers that has, that has deployed um, the uh, visibility IQ, um, so that they know um, that uh, the devices are not uh, they are performing as to uh, what they expect. So this is a uh, example of a Savannah in action. Sure, sure. Now uh, I've got three questions to finish with. One, and, and without giving any secrets away to your competitors, but how do you think? The industry will evolve over the next decade. I mean, you've already spoken about autonomous robots in, you know, logistics and enterprise Tetris thing. But you know, how else do you think it might uh, improve even further um, over the next ten years? Yeah, yeah. I mean, so I'll uh, I'll mention a few areas that, um, or, or it's really there's, a th- there's three legs of a stool that we talk about with regard to this. One is building. Um, infrastructure-based solutions that can help provide better insights. So this is instrumenting environments, whether that's the location solutions example I was giving earlier, or a smart pack for uh, shipping and loading, or smart lens in a retail environment that we, that we mentioned for being able to read those RFID tags and detect inventory. That's, that's one area. Mm-hmm. The second is around augmenting users. So we're making, together with Google, actually, some pretty significant investments in augmented reality, 
heads up display. So being able to put the right information in front of the user in real time and augment what they're seeing in the physical world with digital information. And then the third one is around intelligent automation. So this plays into the locus robotics kinds of examples. And as you said, without giving too much away, I think you should uh, expect over the next uh, 12, 18 months to see a lot more from Zebra around areas of automation, specifically in the computer vision space, machine vision. I think those are going to become really big areas and advancements beyond traditional barcode reading, mm -hmm. as well as you know the physical physical robots themselves. And then finally, um, a category we would call automated decision making, because really when you think about the collection of all this data, you solve, in many cases, you solve one problem and create another, which mm -hmm. is you provide all the visibility that's required to become more intelligent, but then if you require someone to manually go through all of that data to determine the best next move, you've just kind of put a whole swamp of information on that person to go way through and figure out. Mm. So using machine learning and artificial intelligence to automate the decision making is gonna be another area as well for us. Yeah, no, I, I hear that from other people who are in that same sort of space with the AI and ML, trying to make sense of all that data and presenting useful information. Uh, and that's what technology is meant to do. Now, um, my second last question is, is just one that uh, reflects back on all of our, you know, humanity as opposed to all the technology. What's the best piece of advice that each of you has received over uh, the last, over your lives to help you get where you are today? I'll start first. Uh, yeah. Sure. The, uh, the piece of advice I get is, you know, is to be uh, inquisitive, to be curious. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, when you're, um, you, you know, if you're curious, if you're inquisitive, uh, you, you innovate, you think of uh, better ways to do things, you think of uh, how do you uh, get the best of, uh, you know, your time, how do you get the best sort of processes that you have, how do you need to make changes and how do you make the best change to optimize uh, your life, optimize you know, your businesses. So, um, you know, to me, you know, um, being curious, I think has uh, helped me in, in a very big way. Yeah, it's interesting. It's interesting, Ryan, because I think it's, it's two, two things I would say that are related to that. One is, you know, always challenging the status quo and never really being, not, not you know, don't, don't be satisfied with where you are today, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and embrace change. Um, don't look at change as a, uh, as, as something to be avoided, but something to be embraced. And I think that, that that actually plays a lot into the way our CEO runs the company and the way the, the DNA of the, uh, the, the culture of the company is, is organized. And the second one, which is very much related to that, because if you believe that's true, then the second one becomes even more important, which is that, you know, people are your greatest asset, right? And mm -hmm. so really focusing on, on people and, uh, and, and, um, you know, in every sense of that word, whether it's creating a, a family like environment, it's listening. Uh, it's empowering, um, and it's, it's funny because we use the same language around our customers' environments around empowering the frontline worker. That same knowledge we, or the same knowledge, the same wording we use inside of our own company around empowering, um, you know, every individual inside the organization. So we expect, uh, you know, a, a, a fresh engineer out of school to be as innovative in their thinking as, you know, a 20-year veteran. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, they may be working on completely different things given their level of experience, mm -hmm. but we expect them to be, um, you know, uh, challenging themselves equally at their uh, respective levels. So I think those, you know, trust trust and empower people and uh, don't sell. Keep, uh, keep forging forward and challenge the status quo. Sure, sure. So Thomas and Ryan, what's your final message to ITY readers and listeners and for your current and future customers and partners? Invest in Zebra. I think we have a great vision. <laughs> yeah. But we're Put out good solutions. So you invest in Zebra. Yeah. yeah, that's that's right. Invest invest in Zebra. Uh, number one, number two, uh, you can count on us to continue to innovate at the edge for another fifty years. And um, you know, I think uh, I think that uh, as as enterprises require more and more automation to meet the needs and the expectations of their customers, you can be assured we'll we'll always have a customer first mentality to help our customers get where they need to go. So I was thinking when you say invest in Zebra, you also mean you're investing in yourself as the company. So, you know, as the, as the customer. So, well, thank you very much, gentlemen, for your time. Best of luck with the rest of the uh, conference and hope to talk to you again in the future. Right. Very good. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, Alex.